Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In part two of his Prolegomena to Any Future Metaphysics, Immanuel Kant from about section 18 through section 21 is going to be elaborating for us a really, really central distinction. And we could say also a process. And understanding this, I think, for many people can kind of fill in the gaps when they're confused about what is Kant actually trying to tell us about how the mind works, all this stuff later on about concepts and categories. How does this play out? And so the place to begin is with his discussion about experience and the empirical. So he says, while all judgments of experience are empirical, they have their ground in immediate sense perception, all empirical judgments are not therefore judgments of experience. He says, besides the empirical and in general, besides what is given to sensuous intuition, special concepts must be super added. And so we're going to talk about the role these play, concepts which have their origin quite a priori in the pure understanding, right? So let's take a look at that. Special concepts, besondre, concepts that, that are performing a particular role, I mean, kind of a, a universal role too, originally generated in the understanding, in verstande ursprünglich erzeugte. So ursprünglich, you know, this original rising up from within the understanding. And, you know, is there an answer to where these came from or why they're there? Not at this point. And in a certain sense, we just have to sort of take this on. But we're going to find out that there are a number of Verstandbegriffen, right, concepts of the understanding that are going to be playing this essential role. These are things that get added in, as he says, or get imposed. So he says, um, under which every perception must first be all of all subsumed and then by their means changed into experience. So not everything that we experience in one sense of the term counts as experience in a second, more technical sense of the term. So he tells us empirical judgments, if they have objective validity, are what Kant is going to call judgments of experience. Erfahrungsurteil. So Urteil is uh, judgment, right? Erfahrung is the word for experience, what it is that we, we go through, you might say. So he says, those which are only subjectively valid, I name mere judgments of perception. Wahrnehmungsurteil. So again, you see that term urteil, judgment, right? And wahrnehmung is perception, literally taking the truth of something, but he doesn't mean it in that sense because we can be mistaken about it, sort of perceiving it as true, right? And so judgments of perception are not the same thing as judgments of experience. Whereas for some philosophers, maybe they are. And Kant would say, well, they're, they're actually mistaken. So how are these different from each other? We've already been told one main differentiator. These are subjectively valid, gültig, right? They, they are uh, working for, they are acceptable, they count, we could say, but only subjectively, only for one person or a bunch of people, but not for all human beings in general. 
Over on the other side, judgments of experience, these are, as he says, objectively valid. That means that they work, they apply for everybody, for all human beings. Now you can say, well, what if somebody gets a judgment wrong that's supposed to be objectively valid? Well, you can point out to them that they've got it wrong, right? Whereas with subjective judgments of perception, Uh, not quite so easy. Some of these, maybe it really does depend on you know where we are. You know, he, he's got some examples of these later on. The room is warm, sugar sweet, wormwood nasty. Wormwood is a, a thing that was used in medicinals and it's got a kind of bitter taste to it, right? And he says, you know, I don't expect or that I or any other person shall always find it as I now do. Each of these sentences only expresses a reference of two sensations to the same subject, myself, and that only in my present state of perception. So I could taste some sugar and be like, the sugar isn't sweet today. Somebody could be like, well, it's because it's salt, buddy, or baking soda, but it could be sugar and my, my you know, taste gustatory uh, apparatus could not be working right or something's going wrong somewhere, right? There's all sorts of things possible in that respect. When we say that something is a judgment of experience, we're saying it is objectively valid. It holds for everybody. Um, a little bit later, he's going to say, objective validity and necessary universal validity for everybody are equivalent concepts. Gleichbegreife, right? Um, so when we consider a judgment universally valid and ne hence necessary, we understand it to have objective validity. So we've got these, these two, right? What's, what else is different between them? Well, coming back to 18, he says that judgments of perception don't require a pure concept of the understanding, but only the logical connection of perception in a thinking subject. Now, the logical there, don't think in terms of like the discipline of logic and you're doing arguments or something like that. It's much simpler. What he means is you're connecting two things together. The room is warm, right? You're making a judgment. These two things that you're perceiving, you're connecting them together in that judgment. And so logical connections of perception. He also talks about uh, representation, that is, Vorstellung of sensuous, sinnliche intuition, Anschauung. And so anybody who's worked through the first part is already familiar with all of these terms. If we want to get to judgments of experience, we've got to add something, he says. Now he says, all of our judgments are at first merely judgments of perception. They hold good only for us. And we do not till afterwards give them a new reference to an object. And we want that they shall always hold good for us and in the same way for everybody else. But we're often mistaken if we're going just by judgments of perception. How do we get there though? How can we get universal validity? He says, There's no reason for the judgments of other men necessarily to agree with mine if it were not the unity of the object to which they all refer and with which they accord. So they must agree with one another. If we want to have, going back to the topic of this part, if we want to have a universal, necessary, pure, natural science, It's got to be stuff of our experiential world that we can make judgments about that do apply ob objectively, universally, necessarily for everybody. And that, that is, in fact, what we are asserting in this, right? How do we get there? So he says, with all objects of sense, judgments of experience take their objective validity not from the immediate cognition of the object, the perception that we begin with, but merely from the condition of the universal validity of empirical judgments, which never rests upon empirical or sensuous conditions, but upon a pure concept of the understanding. The object in itself always remains unknown, but when, by the concept of the understanding, the connection of the representations of the object which are given to the object by our sen sensibility is determined as universally valid. The object is determined by this, right? So he says, 
um, what experience teaches me under certain, certain circumstances, it must always teach me and everybody. Its validity is not limited to the subject or to its state at a particular time. So when I say, for example, the air is elastic, this judgment is yet a judgment of perception only. I do nothing but refer to sensations in my senses to one another. But if I want to make it a judgment of experience, I have to have this stand under a condition which makes it universally valid. That's what these concepts coming from the understanding are actually doing. They are giving that universal validity to it, not by drawing upon experience, but by using the judgments of experience and working on them in a different way, bringing something new to the, to the picture, right? And so this is actually going to give us um, a transition from my own consciousness to, as he calls it, consciousness in general, Bewusstsein überhaupt, anybody's consciousness. My consciousness of this should be the same as your consciousness, not in the specific perceptions that we have, but in the concept of the understanding that's the same in you as it is in me and everybody else. This is one of the key contributions that Kant is making through his philosophy, right? So, you know, in 20, he says, we have to analyze experience in general and see what is contained in this product of the senses and of the understanding, which then gives us the judgment of experience itself as possible. It says the foundation is the intuition of which I become conscious, the perception which belongs to the senses. Then judging takes place, which happens by the understanding, right? And this judging can be two different kinds. It can be judging that remains just with the perception and compares them with each other. You know, is this spot over here red? Uh, when I put the worm on the fish hook, did I actually get the hook through the worm? Pick whatever you want, right? But if we want to go beyond that, then we have to rely on these concepts of the understanding. And we do that when we judge. He says that, um, there we go. Um, when perception becomes experience, the intuition must be subsumed under a concept which determines the form of judging in general with regard to the intuition, connects the empirical consciousness of the intuition and consciousness in general. So we get this important transition and thereby procures universal validity for empirical judgments. He says a concept of this nature is a pure a priori concept of the understanding, which does nothing but determine for an intuition the general way in which it can be used for judging. And so what's an example of this? Cause, he says, let the concept be that of cause. Then it determines the intuition which is subsumed under it, that of air. With regard to judging in general, the concept of air as regards its expansion serves in the relation of antecedent to consequent in a hypothetical judgment. Therefore, we can go to judgments of experience that have to do with air, right? But we're using a concept coming from the understanding, a pure concept of causality, which we're going to see is only one of many that we could in fact be using. So he says, this is you know, sort of summing things up. Uh, before a judgment of perception can become a judgment of experience, the perception should be subsumed under some concept of the understanding. And then he says, if all of our synthetic judgments are analyzed insofar as they are objectively valid, that is insofar as they are judgments of experience and not merely of perception, they never consist of mere intuitions connected only by comparison into a judgment, but they would be impossible if it were not a pure concept of the understanding, super added to the concepts abstracted from intuition. So he says, even in the judgments of pure mathematics, this holds as well. So then in 21, he's going to say, uh, to prove the possibility of experience so far as it rests on pure a priori concepts of the understanding, 
we have to represent what belongs to judgments in general and the various moments of understanding in them. And this is where we're get, going to get to a sort of schema, a table that Kant will provide us with. And this is where we get to the, you know, the famous uh, categories uh, and, and various types of organizing these a priori pure concepts of the understanding that Kant takes all of us to have and says that he has, uh, you know, finally, in terms of, you know, philosophy's progress, analyzed and placed before us. So we get this very important transition here from judgments of perception to judgments of experience through the super addition or application of these special concepts originally arising out of the understanding.